Hi, my name's Laura. I'm going to talk to you today about how to get more value from digital PR without mentioning AVE. So before I get started, a quick introduction to who I am. So my name is Laura Hampton. I am at Laura L Hampton on Twitter, and I'm the head of digital PR at Impression. Now Impression is a digital marketing agency. We provide search engine optimization, so SEO services for clients, helping them to get found more easily online. Um, we also do paid advertising, paid media work across kind of pay-per-click, um, so PPC ads on Google ads, Bing ads, things like that. We also help with remarketing, display advertising, programmatic, paid social media advertising, all that kind of stuff. Um, we also have an analytics department, so we help businesses to really dig deep into their data, find out what's working for them, what's not, and how they can improve. And we offer digital PR as a service. So by that, I mean we help our clients to be found um, more easily online by helping them to tap into the publications that their audience is already reading, helping them to get seen through media publications, through press, advertise, uh, press features. Um, we help them to also to earn links back to their website. So we know that from an SEO perspective, Every time our clients are featured in the media, in various publications around the web, if a link is included from their site onto our client's site, that really helps to improve our client's search engine rankings, to get found by more people, and essentially to help broaden their audience and make more sales. So that's what we're all about, and I'm here to talk to you about how you can get more value specifically from digital PR campaigns. Now, before I really get started and get into the kind of nitty gritty of this, I just want to bring everyone up to speed on what digital PR actually is. So for anyone who's out there watching this webinar, you're already a seasoned pro, you already know all this kind of stuff. See this as a little bit of a recap um, just to make sure that we're all on the same page. If you haven't invested in digital PR before, or maybe you're an SEO yourself, you're a digital marketer, you're a broader marketer, you're a business owner, whatever it might be, you don't know what it is, I'm here to kind of bring you up to speed there as well. So digital PR was born originally from an SEO need. So we needed to build links. Um, we knew that a huge part of Google's considerations around which websites should appear at the top of the search results listings was about how many people were linking to them, how many websites were including a hyperlink from theirs through to those websites. And every time a, a link was acquired, that was viewed as a vote for that website. So the website with the most votes would rank higher up the search results. Um, so as, as an SEO community, um, as marketers, we needed to build links, as we called it, um, and so we did. And we did it in all sorts of ways as well. So some of the examples on here, hopefully, are getting a few of you watching this kind of cringing and going, oh, I definitely used to do that. Um, and, you know, these are very outdated techniques now, but they were very valid back in the day. So um, we used to do things like article spinning. So we used platforms like Spinbot and similar to um, put an article into there and it would churn out lots and lots of versions of the same article by just kind of reordering the words. So we could create apparently unique content to be able to seed across the web. Um, and we were doing that in uh, a little bit of a sketchy manner, but it worked. Um, we also did things like citation building. So it's still very much a valid technique these days is that you want to appear in relevant directories for your brand and you want to make sure that your, your business is kind of shown to be to be a legitimate business by having its name, its address, its, its phone number listed. Um, but we would list everywhere that we could. It really didn't matter to us. Um, things happen like link farming as well. So people would um, kind of identify the, the core website that they wanted to rank and then build lots of websites around it and include links from those sites back to the core site. Um, We'd also do things like commenting in forums and including a link in our comments. So there were so many kind of sketchy techniques going on, but it was working. Um, I'm talking circa kind of 10 years ago. Um, things were working out for us and we were building links and that was cool until this guy came along. So anyone who's been working in SEO for a little while will remember that the Google Penguin update was the update that specifically targeted those webmasters, those websites, those marketers who were investing in these form of spammy, manipulative um, activities in order to improve or to artificially inflate the number of links that they had coming into their site. So in a world where links are proxies for votes, um, you really, really can't be doing these spammy things. So the Google Penguin update was released and it meant that all of those websites that had been doing these dodgy things were suddenly removed from the search results or they were at least penalized um, quite heavily so that it was discouraged for future businesses. So as I've mentioned, when every link is a vote, um, you really cannot be seen to be manipulating the search results and you have to get creative. So after Google Penguin was released, we started investing more in content. The idea being that 
Rather than trying to build links in kind of sketchy ways, we were actually earning links by creating content that people wanted to link to. Um, this is where we started to see a lot of infographics. So again, for anyone who's been working in the industry for a little while, you'll remember infographics were gold. Um, this is one example that I made when I worked for an agency many years ago now called Zabisco. Um, we actually put together an infographic of infographics. And when I Googled this, I was able to find that this still ranks really well. So um, crazy, crazy times. It was an infographic of infographics. I thought I was a genius, but actually, I actually kind of was going to bring myself up kind of was a genius because that that piece still ranks really really well um, and it also gained loads and loads of links through to um, the agency's website which was exactly what we were trying to do it got featured in places like um like mashable featured it which was amazing those are business sites it's kind of it's all over the web so um infographics were very much the hot topic everybody was creating infographics and part of the reason for that was that it's very difficult for journalists or for publications that exist on the web for people who've got to create lots and lots of content to be able to invest this time in creating something as visual as an infographic. But for us as, as PRs, as those people trying to build content to earn links, creating an infographic was relatively easy. Quite often an SEO agency or a digital PR agency has some kind of design functions. So we were creating these visuals and finding that journalists and other webmasters really were lapping them up um, and they were using them a lot and we were using that a lot to, to earn links as well. Um, so infographics became hugely popular as shown by this Google Trends graph um, and meanwhile while SEOs were kind of investing in infographics and kind of slightly dodgy techniques earlier on um, to, to build links, PR pros were absolutely smashing it, um, achieving coverage and raising awareness through traditional PR activity. So um, what we actually started to see was that as SEOs we saw what the PR community was doing we saw the results that they were getting and we wanted it, um, like the little magpies that we are. So we start to see this move now from SEO, um, kind of driving the, the link building techniques and still, still legitimately and quite validly investing in techniques like broken link building or um, resource-based link building or kind of citations as well to an extent. But we're starting to see more of a move into those PR ways of thinking um, and the birth of really digital PR. And this is some of the content that um, my team has been creating, the digital PR team at Impression, just to give a few examples of what that looks like. So it's no secret that infographics are still um, a great way of getting coverage, of getting your brand seen, because visual representations of, um, especially more complicated ideas, if you've got a visual representation, that's usually easier to digest and people are more willing to use it than they would be if this information had been just written as text. So um, the purple graphic that you can see on the screen at the moment, this was done for an energy client of ours. They really wanted to build up um, awareness of their brand as an electric vehicle supplier. They also knew that they needed links coming through to the site in order to improve their search rankings so that they could be seen more for things relating to electric vehicles. So what we did here, um, this was my colleague James, James Watkins, and what he did is he took the number of electric vehicle charging points in the country, and then he also took the number of drivers around the country to work out how many drivers there were per charging point. That gave him an index of where in the country was considered therefore to be most prepared for electric vehicles, so where had the most charging points per driver and where was least prepared. Um, this got over 300 pieces of coverage, including kind of national press, local press, right through to kind of environmental websites, um, automotive websites, um, anything to do with kind of energy and electricals and charging and all kind of engineering stuff. So there was a huge range of new links um, and new coverage generated for that business um, off the back of this particular um, PR campaign. So it's very much kind of taking that SEO starting point, knowing what we needed to achieve and applying more traditional PR ways of thinking in order to make something press worthy and link worthy. Um, we've got something on the um, other side, so face the facts, being hung over and having a beard are causing the biggest delays to passengers at e-passport airport gates. Um, so this was something where, um, again, this was done by our team where we knew that we needed to get high quality links. So we needed to get links of a high domain rating. Um, we needed to get lots of places to cover this um, particular client of ours, their brand. We wanted to get their name out there a bit more. And we created this campaign whereby we identified the top reasons that e-passport gates fail. And then we applied um, time to each one of those different things. So we were able to prove that being hungover and having a beard 
are the things that are causing the biggest delays at airports. Um, and that was something that travelled really, really well as well. So again, we had kind of lots of national press coverage, um, international travel press, all that sort of thing picked this up, which was great. Um, and we also have the one in the middle, which is Google versus reality. So this was for a more business to business site. But again, just showing how um, you can kind of visualize content and make something press worthy. What we did here is we simply went onto the Google search results in lots of different countries and typed in the word CEO. And when we went into the images, a lot of those countries either were very male dominated, had very few females, um, or there was something noteworthy within them. So what you see in the graphic here is that we've visualized how many females were shown within the image search results versus how many female CEOs there actually were in each country. So again, it's, it's kind of starting from an SEO point of view in terms of what we're trying to achieve, but putting our PR hats on. In, a, in being able to actually create something compelling and link worthy and something that the press is going to want to use. Um, so more and more we've seen that kind of thinking taking place. And it's not just these kind of more visual or data-led campaigns that are becoming more prolific. Actually, I would argue that we're straying ever further into the realms of traditional PRs. And here are just a few examples of how that's happening. So um, We've got Donald Trump there in the top corner. This was a campaign run by my colleague Jess Hawks. And what she did is she was working with um, an environmental building supplier and they had some budget which they were going to donate to the Rainforest Trust. And the Rainforest Trust said, OK, that's cool. Um, in return for your donation, we will allow you to name a new species of worm. Um, and this species of worm had been identified as being one which would hide its head in the sand at the, any sign of danger. Um, it was this new species. And because the brand was very politically driven and had very clear kind of thoughts and opinions that it wanted to share around climate change, what Jess suggested was that we name the worm after Donald Trump. So there is now a species of worm named after him. Um, and that achieved over 900 pieces of coverage, about half of which um, included links through to the site. And as a result of that, the environmental buildings material brand that we work with saw huge improvements in their ranking positions, their traffic and their sales as a, as a result. So um, it's not just about necessarily creating kind of on-site assets or, or big visuals. Actually, this is a very traditional PR campaign in its, in its approach that has driven digital results. Um, my colleague Damien did the anti-nightmare mess that you can see there. So um, Damien Summers, he was working with a brand which um, sells kids' beds, amongst other things. They really knew from an SEO perspective that they needed to generate links back through to the kids' bed section of their site from publications which were of a higher quality, but also publications that were relevant to parenting and to kids. So what he did is he came up with this product stunt, whereby um, it's actually a fake product, or it was, they actually went on to make it because it did so well, but it started live as a fake product, this idea of a mist that you could spray under the bed that would get rid of the monsters under the bed. And um, We sent it out around Halloween time, and that was something that, again, huge amounts of coverage. More importantly, the links that we were gaining through that were super, super relevant and targeted to the whole kids and parents parenting sector which has had a marked improvement on the rankings, the traffic and the sales of that brand. So again, it's traditional PR thinking, this idea of a product stunt, um, which has driven digital results. I've also got a couple on the bottom here, dream jobs campaigns. So one is for spa seekers. You could apply to become a professional spa tester. This is something done by a lady called Carrie Rose, um, who runs an agency called Rise at Seven. And then on the other side to that, we've got the dream job of a bathtub tester um, run by someone called Lexi Mills. So these are examples where, again, we've taken traditional PR thinking and applied it to our digital goals. So that's great for us as an industry. It means we're evolving all the time. And especially as digital PRs, we're seeing this move away from more traditionally kind of SEO link building-y kind of tactics and more into the kind of traditional um, PR or maybe more creative thinking where we're able to create stories, create news, um, own various narratives in order to get our clients seen and to affect not just their search um, rankings, but also more broadly their kind of brand visibility, the perceptions of their brand um, and various other benefits that they get as well. So from our, our perspective, it's fantastic. Um, from a client's perspective, though, or for anyone who's watching this webinar and thinking, well, do I want to invest in digital PR then? Or do I want to invest in traditional PR? Or maybe I want SEO. If this is a thing that sits in between the two, why would I invest in all three if I can just invest in one? Or if I'm going to invest in digital PR, maybe I want to not use traditional. It can become quite a confusing thing. So what we've really tried to do is recognise that the closer our services become, um, the more that we as digital PRs 
actually have to compete with SEOs and traditional PRs and that you guys out there watching this, if you're not digital PRs yourself, you're maybe a marketing manager or a business owner or an SEO manager or whatever it might be, you're thinking about where you should invest your money, you're probably getting a little bit of that confusion around, well, should I put it into digital PR? Should I put it into traditional? Should I just put it into SEO? What should I do? So the closer those service areas have become, the more we really need to think about how you guys out there who are trying to kind of deliver this service for are having to make more and more complex decisions. To help with that then, I just want to have a look at how SEO typically is pitched. So um, what I've done is I've gone into the search results, I've searched for SEO agency, and then I've brought out some of the words that are used on the websites of of SEO agencies. So um, we've got words coming up here like um, search results to deliver high quality targeted traffic to your websites, increase visibility within the algorithmic um, search results. It's an essential marketing channel, um, get it right, you can expect more traffic and more leads for more sales, more money to your business, technical, crawl, render. It's all very kind of, um, it's all very scientific in its approach. It's all very measurable, tangible, data-driven, you're going to make sales from this, there's going to be an impact for your business. Um, and that's really cool, that's what I really like about SEO is that you know if you put an investment in, if you work with the right people, the chances are you're going to get a good, good return on that investment. Um, what we therefore do as a digital PR team at Impression is that we like to talk about making things as tangible as, as we possibly can um, for you as, as the kind of people investing in this, for the stakeholders who are questioning you on your investment. We like to make sure that we have got real clarity around what success looks like and therefore we talk about something called owned goals. So owned goals are the things that a digital PR team can own. You should expect this of the digital PR teams that you're investing with is that they're able to tell you how many links they've built. So they've got, you know, relatively good control over how many links they're able to build based on the success of their campaign, the quality of those links. So the targets that we have when we're outreaching campaigns, when we're trying to sell the campaigns into the press, we would think about the quality of links that we need to achieve. We can talk about topical relevance of links. So there's a, a metric called topic flow with um, a tool called Majestic. So you can actually measure it there. We also talk about the positioning of links and kind of page rank and how link equity is being passed through your site. So these are very much the things that we can own and it makes it a quantifiable thing. But also tying digital PR more broadly into SEO and kind of answering the question of how the two might play together is that we talk about shared goals as well. So we know that every time we get a link through to one of our clients' sites or every time you're earning a link through to your site, that link counts as a vote. So you should expect the more votes you have, the higher your ranking position will be. So your digital PR team, whether that's in-house or an agency or, or something you're doing yourself, you should really be having conversations around these shared goals of ranking improvements, traffic improvements, and revenue growth. Now, that's not to say you should judge your digital PR efforts solely on their ability to achieve these things, because actually these things are part of a bigger picture. We know that we could drive hundreds of fantastic quality links through to your site, but if it's technically not working or the content isn't very good, you're not going to see those ranking improvements. You're not going to get traffic improvements. You're not going to see revenue growth. Um, similarly, you know, it doesn't matter how much we're kind of feeding into your, your digital PR strategy and building links back to your site. If you either don't have the right products or the products are pitched too, um, too expensive or they're not quite right for the audience, again, you're not going to see that revenue growth. Um, so it's really got to be about having that open conversation and saying, here are the things that your digital PR team can own. So the number of links, the quality of links and so on but then also having a conversation around the things that you share in the kind of overall end goals that we're all trying to get to so that we can understand how best each element of your marketing activity can contribute. So takeaway number one from this presentation then is that we really need to, as digital PRs, we need to report on shared goals as well as owned goals. Um, but also if you are not a digital PR yourself and you're investing in digital PR, you need to expect your digital PR teams to be able to report on these things um, and to be able to integrate themselves with SEO. So answering your queries that you might have around, do I invest in SEO or digital PR? Ideally, both, because both are absolutely essential to improving your search rankings and getting you more traffic and more sales. Um, but it's important they work together. Cool, so that's SEO kind of ticked off. They speak very, um, SEO, SEO agencies speak in a very data-driven, quite technical way because that's what SEO is inherently all about. It's about measurable, um, tangible improvements for your business. 
Let's have a look and do the same with PR then. So exactly the same activity, I put PR agency into Google and I've taken some of the wording from some of the top results within that search query. Um, so what we see here is they use words like thought leaders, storytellers, um, we generate media endorsement and audience engagement. Um, we are uh, shaping stories for multi-platform campaigns. It's all, I would argue, quite fluffy. And I, I mean this in the nicest way because there's definitely value to these things and um, recognising the value is it's, it's quite challenging. You know, if you guys out there watching are um, maybe not of a PR background yourself, it's quite a leap to be able to see how the coverage that you're achieving is actually changing perceptions. But if you can buy into that idea, you'll see kind of the benefits and you're probably going to be more likely to invest and are more inclined to, to use this sort of activity. So I'm not by any means saying that PR um, is pitching itself wrong, but what I am trying to make the point about is that it's very much a different approach than SEO agencies. So SEO is very much like these are the the measurable things that are going to happen, whereas PR is more kind of trust us. This is kind of less tangible, but still equally valuable. Um, so it's, it is quite difficult, I would argue, to be able to set, you know, really tangible um, expected outcomes from PR. That's not to say the PR industry hasn't tried. So um, the title of this talk is around not mentioning AVE. AVE stands for Advertising Value Equivalent, and it is a metric that we used to use and that many PR agencies still do, whereby you can identify how much it would cost to advertise within a publication and therefore apply a monetary value to the free coverage that you're able to secure through PR. So let's say we're able to get a full, um, a full page in a magazine and we know that advertising for a full page placement is a thousand pounds then you can say the advertising value equivalent of this coverage is a thousand pounds um it's fine it was kind of it worked as a proxy back in the day but i would argue that in a digital world where things are far more measurable it's not really enough um similar with circulation figures where you know saying that we've got you into a publication with a circulation figure of 300,000 doesn't mean that 300,000 people have seen it but it was always a useful proxy and there's also talk about kind of outcomes outputs outtakes there's been various efforts made to make PR more quantifiable um, but I would argue that the core benefit of digital is that it's measurable and tangible so reliance on these metrics actually makes no sense for us if we want to be seen as digital PRs and that's what we're investing in it's really got to be about measurable gains things that we can tangibly tie back to our activity and say, this is what we put in and this is what we got out. It's about making those goals smart as well as much as anything else. So this is quite an old um, framework. I know it's been around a very, very long time, but it's still very much applicable. You know, how can you take those ideas of um, brand awareness or brand positioning or brand perceptions and actually make them specific, measurable, achievable, relevant and timely? That's how we kind of create that difference between digital PR and traditional PR and again if you were asking or if you're on this webinar thinking well I'm, I'm currently investing in in digital PR maybe I don't need traditional PR or vice versa actually there is quite a clear line drawn between the two because any activity that will deliver a measurable gain I would argue can come from digital PR but any activity where there is not a measurable gain or it's much harder to measure so things like I don't know, crisis comms, let's say, it's very difficult to apply a tangible, measurable gain to that type of activity. So that's where traditional PR will still very much play an important role. Um, so let's kind of work this through then. So in traditional PR, we might talk about, might talk about awareness. Um, awareness is very difficult to kind of quantify um, unless you can make it into a smart goal. So awareness usually breaks down into something like traffic to core pages um, or the campaign landing page itself. Um, we also talk about visibility. So again, the term visibility doesn't really have any meaning unless you make it quantifiable. Um, that might be things like share a voice via your keyword tracking tools or kind of branded or campaign keyword impressions via search console. Whatever you need to do to kind of make visibility, it might even just be the number of people viewing your site and um, the click through rate from the search results. Anything like that can be kind of quantified within visibility. Um, and sentiment, this is something that is often kind of spoken around, um, in particular reference to social media use in traditional PR. So it's about getting a positive sentiment out there, getting people to think well of your brand. Again, how do we make that quantifiable? Um, some people use social listening tools. We've been kind of playing around with using um, natural language processing tools and things like that. But really think about how you can make those sorts of goals into something smart and measurable. 
So takeaway number two is that in order to differentiate from traditional PRs, so if you're currently working in digital PR, if you want to differentiate yourself, you need to be willing to report on PR metrics because that is part of the inherent value of what we do, but make it smart. If you're out there, you're watching this because you are investing in digital PR, my argument to you, but you need to have a team that can deliver clear insight into the impact of their work based on something measurable. They should have measurable goals, measurable gains in mind with the activity that they do. Um, and digital PR isn't just a combination of SEO and PR. So when we're talking about getting more value out of digital PR, yes, we should be reporting back on SEO goals. Yes, we should be willing to report on PR goals. But more broadly than that, it is a discipline within its own right. So it should form part of, of better, more integrated strategies. Let me tell you what I mean about that. So firstly, I've already spoken about digital PR and SEO and kind of how we're using it to earn links back to a website. The links are great, but let's also optimize our assets. Let's, um, let's look at kind of funneling our link equity into the right places. So when I talk about optimizing an asset, most of the time, if you're doing digital PR, you will create something on your site for people to link back to, whether it's the kind of application page for your dream job, or it's the product page for your fake product, or if it's the kind of area where your infographic is hosted or where your data is, whatever it might be. Let's make sure that's optimized for search queries that people might might search for when they want to find that type of information so where are the electric vehicle charging points in the country let's optimize our ev campaign our electric vehicles map campaign that i referenced earlier let's optimize it for that type of term so that we know that even if we're we're not thinking specifically about the link benefit we're potentially getting traffic through to that page because people can find it um let's also think about funneling our link equity appropriately so what i mean by that is that it's really frustrating for me seeing campaigns that sit on what I would call an orphan page. So um, yourwebsite.com forward slash campaign. That is a, um, a campaign sitting in the top level folder structure, but not really kind of assigned to a specific area of your site. It's kind of just floating around. And to me, that feels very much like it's been done solely to get links. It's not part of the user journey. People can't find it very easily. It's just kind of, it's just kind of there. Um, whereas if we can think about where to place that content and maybe putting, um, you know, our fake products campaign that we did with the kids beds brand that sat within the kids bed section of the site so that we know all of the links coming through to that campaign, the, the value of those links actually channels through to the pages closest to it. So that's why we saw very marked increases and in improvements around the kids beds keywords as a result of that particular campaign. So think about being intelligent and tying your digital PR goals together with your SEO goals and letting the two inform one another so you can drive as much value as possible. Um, digital PR and PPC or paid media as well can work really, really well together. So for me, one of the biggest benefits of investing in digital PR is that you're getting some of that kind of PR driven um, benefit and value of audience expansion. So it's about not just doing things to gain links, but doing things to get you in front of the right audiences and with the right kinds of messaging. So savvy marketers, in my opinion, should be thinking about how best to make use of that additional audience visibility that we're gaining. That might be things like building remarketing lists. So if you've got a piece of content that sits on your site, that's gaining links, that's getting you media coverage, let's make sure that we're tracking people who visit that page and then we've got a clear plan in mind to be able to then send further content, further kind of sales material through to those people. Potentially we can see them moving through to conversion. We can apply a proper kind of revenue-based goal to our digital PR campaign. So be sure to be using remarketing cookies where appropriate. And um, also capturing any other data. So that might be encouraging people to give you their email address um, in return for something like using the tool that you've created or maybe um, getting people to follow you on social media so you can kind of interact with them more easily thereafter with that as well. It's kind of really, um, really important that if you do want to be much more savvy and get more value out of your digital PR campaigns, you think about how best to tie those digital PR campaigns into your paid media activity as well. Um, and something that we've been doing quite a lot and talking about quite a lot as well at Impression is this idea of funnel campaigns. So for us, we will have a piece of digital PR content, which more often than not is kind of very top of the funnel. So the content that we create is much more kind of applicable to those users at the awareness end of the funnel, purely because it's very difficult to get sales content into the media. Um, so for us at Impression, it's much less likely that we'll be out there kind of talking about buying SEO or PPC from us than it is talking kind of more broadly about marketing or, or maybe kind of expanding even further beyond that. So 
the nature of digital PR campaigns is such that you're more often speaking at the top end of this funnel that you can see on the screen. So it's more about kind of the awareness, interest driving content. Um, but if we recognize that, we can then use that to our advantage and tie it into other channels to actually push users through to that desire and that action phase. Um, let me give some tangible examples. So with the electric vehicles piece, um, we got, as I already mentioned, over 300 pieces of coverage. So the link value was huge and we saw rankings improve and all that sort of thing. But we also invested in some paid social advertising whereby we took that campaign content, put it out through Facebook um, and we were able to kind of quite, um, quite specifically target it to people like, as you can see on the screen, Portsmouth was falling foul of public EV charging points. So because Portsmouth had one of the lowest number of charging points, we put that out to people in Portsmouth and we were like, kind of are you ready for electric vehicles we also had Sunderland leading the vehicle revolution the electric vehicle revolution we put that out to Sunderland people we also put it out nationally put it out to anyone interested in electric vehicles so we were actually able to see how that content could travel really well within that audience and drive conversions and drive action that way so think about how you can kind of use those funnel campaigns um, and in that sense, we're driving even more value out of our digital PR efforts by tying it together, not just with SEO um, and not just with traditional PR, but actually tying it into PPC as well, making it much more a part of the broader marketing mix. And these are just a couple of examples that I'm going to kind of flip through. Um, but also think about tangible KPIs as well. So relating to things like audience building, you might want to set goals if you are investing in a larger scale um, digital PR campaign, with, maybe with some kind of interactive element to it, maybe some big kind of um, developed on-site asset. You probably want to have a think about how you're tracking the number of people that are visiting it and how best you can quantify the value of those new audiences. So looking at the number of people that you're putting into your remarketing list, looking then at the conversion rate of those people, that can really tie into much more tangible um, KPIs, tangible key performance indicators and tangible um, results and outcomes as well for your investment. Um, so that's a really great way of driving more revenue, uh, driving more value. So takeaway number three is that the discipline of digital PR is really evolving. Um, but for me, that really does represent a huge opportunity, whether you're working in digital PR yourself or if you're investing in digital PR as a marketer, as an SEO, as a traditional PR, whatever it may be, we really have this opportunity to invest in the evolution of that discipline and to continually drive more, more value um, and more benefit from it. So top takeaways, how to get more value from digital PR. Firstly, be better SEOs. So report on owned goals, also report on shared goals. That means if you are investing in digital PR, um, whether it's internally or if you've got an agency involved, you need to make sure that you are sharing those wider aspirations. So a brief that just says simply build some links, or get some coverage, it's really not enough if you want to drive as much value as possible. We need to be much more specific about what we're trying to achieve from an SEO perspective. We also need to be better PRs. So let's not only judge our digital PR teams on their ability to build links, let's recognize the broader benefits of that form of activity in that it is about engaging with an audience, it is about putting the right messages out there, but we need to make it measurable. It's got to be about kind of tangible, measurable gains. And that's how we draw the line between digital PR and traditional. Um, and be better marketers. So think multi-channel, think integrated, think user first, think how can we tie these PR investments that we're making into our broader marketing aspirations. Um, and as I've already mentioned, our discipline is still evolving and we get to choose how. So it's a big opportunity. I really hope that's been a useful insight for you. Um, like I said, whether you're in the industry or if you're just looking to invest in it, you're already investing. Hopefully it's given you a little bit of insight around how you can drive even more value. Um, my name's Laura Hampton. I'm at Laura L. Hampton on Twitter. You can email me, laura at impression.co.uk. Um, you can also find us at Impression Talk. Um, follow us on Twitter. Also, we've got lots more webinar content, lots more kind of white papers, blog posts over at impression.co.uk. Sign up for some of our events, follow us on our newsletter. Um, if you do have any questions, if you want to talk to me about anything that I've talked about here or more broadly about PR, do get in touch. I know some of you have been sending questions through throughout the webinar as well. So apologies, I haven't had time to get those answered for you, but I will. Um, I will follow up and make sure that you guys get the answers that you're looking for. So Thank you so much for your time and um, all the best for all of your marketing efforts and hopefully catch you again soon. Bye.